Um, thank you, everyone. I, um, you have a copy of the PowerPoint. If you're with um, Trala, um, I mean, I have enough copies, so please share with your neighbor, um, and I'll get you a copy when you get back to the office. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, as you may have heard earlier, um, our intent today is to ensure that while um, survivors are grieving, um, we can help them alleviate some of the everyday concerns. This is a, I wish I could tell you that the world stopped for everyone, it didn't. Um, they're grieving, they're healing emotionally, spiritually, physically, and the bills are still piling up and um, things are still becoming due. And so we are hoping that um, a number of you will sign up to help us with um, what can be pretty straightforward law um, if you do it right. If you do it wrong, then um, we, don't, we, want, we don't want you to do it wrong. So always feel free to come to us if you have questions. So the first thing we want to tell people is to not panic. Um, we don't want people to make decisions or give advice. It's going to put survivors in a worse position down the line. Um, don't encourage anyone to take on a payday loan or any other kind of loan that's immediate. Um, don't encourage them to declare bankruptcy. Um, don't encourage them to move out of their property. And don't encourage them to sell valuables. These are, no one will lose their home overnight if you follow the advice you're about to be given. Um, but do take action. So the first thing we want everyone to do is to identify any urgent deadlines that might be coming up. Um, reach out to opposing parties for appropriate extensions um, before you take on dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, or drastic measures. And then remember that survivors, whether they're buying or renting, can only be removed from a property after an eviction. Okay, so if you have someone that, that's come to you, you've been, refer, you know, you've been referred to someone through our office, what are the initial questions? The first question you want to ask is, um, were you, or are you buying or renting? And the you could be the deceased, it could be a surviving spouse, it could be a child. Um, and, and the next question is, who has the right to deal with the, le the lender, if it's a mortgage, or the landlord if they were renting? So you want to be prepared. You want to make sure that they're already, they already have police reports ready, that you have any documents that identify legal errors. It may be possible that someone left a transfer on death deed, that would be great, um, or a will. Um, and a certificate of death copy, you want to get that from the funeral home as soon as possible. And then any other documents that deal with distributing the property at death. So were they buying? If they're buying and there's a loan on the property, um, you want to ask what kind of loan is it? Is it a traditional mortgage loan? So that's a loan where you just have one lien on the property from a, a lender, or is it a wraparound? And the wraparounds are basically um, a little bit crazy, but it's when you have one lien that's by usually a traditional lender, um, and then someone comes and sells a house again, and sells it with another lien, but doesn't pay off the first lien. So you wanna always deal with the first lien holder. The middle person, you can probably fend off for a little bit, but if it's like Bank of America or the VA, they're not going to be as lenient, so you want to make sure that you're dealing with all of the loans that are on the property. If it's a home equity loan, um, tax loan, reverse mortgage, a contract for deed, um, and those are, of course, the contract for deeds are documents or um, contracts that do, um, have not transferred with a warranty deed yet, so the person is not the title holder. Um, and then also there might be some other obligations that are accruing, like the condo association, debt, um, or homeowner association. Fees. Then you want to ask them, are you current, right? Were you current when this happened? Are you current now? Um, were they behind before August 3rd? If they were, then you need to get as much information about the loan as soon as possible because those deadlines are going to come very fast. And if you don't, if your client doesn't have the money to pay that, then we're going to get in trouble. So foreclosures, this is traditional mortgages that are non-judicial. These are the foreclosures that happen at the courthouse on the first floor on the first Tuesday of every month. The first thing that someone gets if they don't pay their mortgage for a month um, is a notice of default. That's a demand letter. And typically you get 20, um, 20 calendar days to, to pay the default. So say you owe $1,000 for the mortgage from August. Once you get your notice, you have 20 days to pay that um, default, and then once September comes, you're going to also be responsible for the September payment. The deed of trust will tell you what the debt, um, what the um, default period is. It could be um, 30 days, for instance. The notice of sale is um, 
filed, posted, and mailed. And this notice will basically tell you they've accelerated the note. So you need to pay all of it. If you owed $100,000, you need to pay all of it. Typically what happens is that even if, if you're able to pay the default, you're able to stay off the acceleration notice. But it does mean that you need to hurry. Like you've only got um, 21 days to respond and to take care of things. Um, um, our clients, I mean, you get the copy through certified mail. Ignor ignorance is not bliss. So it may be that someone's still in the hospital. Someone needs to be checking their mail. Someone needs to be on top of things because they may not have the wherewithal to deal with this, but someone is going to have to deal with it. And so um, uh, make sure that they're picking up their certified mail if they've gotten notices and that someone is reading the mail regularly. And then once that the, these two time periods have lapsed, the, the um, sale will be posted. Um, we can look at the foreclosure map on the county website um, to see if that's been done. You can also look at the public records to see if a notice of sale has already been posted. Okay, so how do you stop a for if, if you're at the foreclosure stage, how do you stop it? Ideally, you want to talk to the lender, and ideally the lender will look at the police report, will not have been under a rock for the last few weeks, and will understand the situation. Um, but if they're not willing to work with you, or you can't um, find someone to put something in writing that they're pulling the sale, then you need to file a TRO. So there's straining orders. We have plenty of samples. Um, we have yet to get one denied. It buys you 14 days until you have a TI. But um, I think, especially given the circumstances, I don't think we're going to get any restraining orders denied um, in this situation. Now, there's a, another uh, foreclosure process for some of the loans that I talked about. So for home equities, tax loans, um, HOA uh, lawsuits, and reverse mortgages, this, um, where the borrower is still alive, just maybe um, in, unable to, to deal with the reverse mortgage obligations, the, um, the lender has to go through the courts in order to foreclose on you. And so they have to um, file a 736 application. So it's a lawsuit, but it's really fast. And so the deadlines are pretty swift. And you need to um, get on, you know, get on board with filing an answer, affirmative defenses, and um, if you don't respond on time, there could be a default judgment, which then means that they're allowed to place it um, on the foreclosure sale calendar for the following um, first Tuesday of, of the next month. So the loan information. So one of um, we've talked to different victims and. Um, it is common that the head of household, um, or there was one person in the household that dealt with everything, right? So you have a surviving spouse or surviving um, child that has no idea if there's a loan on the house, um, if anything is due, what the account number is on, who the, uh, our, who the lender is, um, what is due. And so if, and, and a lot of people are doing paperless billing. And so if you don't have access to people's accounts, the bank is not going to give you that information. So what do you do? You can look at the public deed records, and our county is really great at having um, access to them. If you can't figure out online, we can help you, how, you know, figure out how to do that. If not, you can come in person and go to the deed records office, and they'll put up the deed of trust. Um, the, those will tell you who the lender is. So you can contact the lender and see if you can get some information. It's possible that if it's a surviving spouse that they were named on the loan or on the warranty deed and the bank might give you some leniency there in terms of immediate information. Um, also, if you're not paying, they do have to give you a default notice in writing. So that's why checking the mail is really important because you'll get that in the mail. Um, and then you'll have the account information on that. Um, and then you want to ask whether the victim had mortgage protection insurance, because they may have. And if they did, then that, and once you prove that they've passed away, then the mortgage will get paid, which would be, which would be great. Um, heirs. So um, there's um, the deed of trust is a document that basically outlines the, the loan. Um, there's a promissory note that doesn't get filed, but the deed of trust is filed with the deed records. And that's going to tell you what, you know, what the bank thinks um, about successors and interest, who gets to really take over the loan. Um, and if you're a successor and in interest, you can actually, um, and you have good credit, you can assume the loan, which is really great, because that means you just step into that, that borrower's position. You don't have to go through any kind of additional cost. And honestly, if people are paying their mortgage, no one's going to bother them. 
What I'm talking about is when right now people may not have access to any money because just like they can't access information about the mortgage, they may not be able to access the bank account. And so um, we're assuming that there is little to no access to cash um, to pay some of these, to pay the mortgage. Um, if um, the heirs can also refinance, if that's something that, that is beneficial to them, but there is a, a closing cost or there are closing costs associated with refinancing. Um, so you want to contact the lender and you want to ask them like, what do we need to show you to access the account information? Um, if they're unresponsive, you want to send them a certified letter um, and asking, and it's going to be called a request for information. Um, I handed out samples of those. If you didn't get one, let me know and I can email it to you. And they have three to 45 days to respond. If they don't, then they're liable for damages. And I think this would really help you support any kind of restraining order application that you're submitting to the court. Yes. Uh, yes, that's a long time. Yeah, for them to respond. Yes, they get a lot. Usually, lenders get longer deadlines than the consumer. Okay, so um, it could be that the the lender is um, a small lender, or they're doing owner financing, which we see a lot in El Paso, um, and it's the. So the federal rules may not apply, but the Texas Finance Code does apply, and it requires um, them to provide the surviving spouse information so long as they have a certificate of death, uh, affidavit of airship, um, or an, aff <coughs> an affidavit signed by the spouse stating that they're still living in the property. Reverse mortgages. Ah, we don't like these, <laughs> um, but a lot of our clients have them, and. We do know that some of the people that, that were impacted were elderly and they're very popular among the elderly community. Um, so if the, um, the right of possession um, ends when the person has passed away, um, but the surviving heirs can save the, the house if they can pay back the loan. So it's really important to look at the, the documents um, to see whether the, so when you, you do a reverse mortgage, you're basically selling your house while you're alive, but you, you have it the life estate. So you get to use it but you're getting paid for 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 the house. Um, so sometimes these are structured where you get a lump sum every year, every two years. Sometimes you get the lump sum up front. And so if the heirs are trying to save the house, then um, you have to figure out how much has been paid out on the, on the behalf of the borrower. Um, and the surviving heirs are entitled to equity. So even if the house is goes back to the to the um, bank. If there's equity still in the house, the survivors are entitled to get that. Um, property taxes. So even if there is no mortgage on the house, that's awesome, great, no mortgage on the house, but you are still having to pay property taxes. So they're due, as we all know, January 31st um, of, and I put 2019, which should be 2020, but they're gonna be due at 31st, before the 31st of January of every year. Um, if a lot of people who are older, over 65, you can get a tax deferral or if you're disabled. So that means that you don't pay taxes. Well, you don't pay taxes, but the taxes are accumulating on the property. And so when the person, um, the, 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 you know, both, if we assume both owners or the owners have passed away, those deferrals pass away with them. So you have, um, is it six months after that, everything's going to become due on the taxes and that's when the city um, the city's tax attorneys can um, can move to um, foreclose on the property and again they're going to have to go through a lawsuit because it's a tax um, case um, with reverse mortgages even though you no longer technically own the house you're still responsible for the taxes and insurance so a lot of our clients don't realize that they may have had a tax deferral um, well, once they transferred the property to the lender, that deferral um, was became it went away. Now the, the taxes are due every single year, as is insurance. And so the surviving um, spouse or the surviving um, heirs have to deal with those taxes as well. Do you have a can, the, can the heirs, when they're, um, let's say, you have surviving children who are trying to pay the, the property from the um, from the reverse mortgage can they do a refinance of a regular uh, a regular donor mortgage to do that yes and how how um, how amenable are the banks to doing that banks want money 
So if, I mean, they, they're, if they're going to get money from the refinance, it's not going to be, it's going to be favorable to them, but they're, they're going to be okay with, with most of the time, depending on what the offer is. Um, it's just sometimes in El Paso we're dealing with primarily, I mean, very few areas in our city um, get equity really quickly. And so if, I mean, it, we're just, it's not, we're not other cities where, you know, you live in a house for two years, now you have $50,000 in equity. It's just not going to happen. So it really becomes a question of how important is this house to the family. Um, and if there's a surviving spouse, and I think that's really when it becomes an issue, where it may not be an issue. We're talking about when the surviving spouse is, is not there anymore. And then we don't have any right to make a hardship exemption application or things like that. So we can get relatively creative with the reverse mortgages if a surviving spouse um, is, is there to, to make that claim. Okay, so now we're going to talk about renters. So if a person um, was renting, um, we want to ask what kind of lease did they have? Was it with a private landlord? Was it a private landlord with Section 8, which is subsidized housing? Was, were they living in public housing? Um, did they have a mobile home? And when was their last rent payment? Um, and who was listed as the head of household? That becomes a greater issue when we're dealing with subsidized housing and who gets to take over um, the head of household status. Evictions. In Texas, we don't allow self-help evictions. That means that in order for a person to be physically removed from a property, and this is an eviction even post foreclosure. Okay, so if say you're, you, you're, the house is lost at foreclosure, you cannot be removed the next day. They still have to give you what I'm going to talk about in terms of notice and time um, in order to remove you, even if it's post foreclosure. So this applies to both um, foreclosure, post foreclosure evictions as well as rental evictions. Um, so you, they have to file an eviction lawsuit um, with the Peace Court. Um, and the, the JP Court for eviction courts has to be the JP Court in um, their precinct. So that's a good way to get rid of a case sometimes if the bank um, files in the, wrong, in the wrong JP Court. And we have seven of them, um, eight of them, because um, we have two JP6s. So um, that's important to keep in mind. Um, the landlord can lock you out. This happens a lot with people who haven't paid their rent. They'll come home and the locks have been changed. And so they have to follow a process, which is basically to give you a notice um, that you have, um, you know, a notice that says, hey, you're late, you need to come see me about the rent. And then there has to be a number that's available 24 hours to give you a new key. So the lockout is just temporary. It's not supposed to be a permanent thing. It's supposed to be a, a, a way to force the tenant to have face-to-face -face contact with the landlord, but it's not supposed to be punitive. Um, the landlord cannot interrupt your utilities um, for not paying the, the rent. So the notice to vacate, again, it applies post foreclosure or regular rental evictions. You have to have three-day notice um, in writing, and it has to be delivered to a person um, or anyone um, in the unit over 16 um, or by mail. It can be posted on the inside of your front door or outside of, um, of the front door if there's if they hear a dog that's loud or if you if the person inside is like you know threatening something then then they can just leave it outside um, subsidized housing i think that um, if you do have a case that someone is in subsidized housing i would recommend that you contact us immediately because those rules are a little bit different and we have a lot of experience dealing with um, the housing authority okay so the eviction lawsuit, I think, have any of you, can I have a show of hands, how many of you have done eviction lawsuits? Yes, okay, so a good number of you. Um, so there's plenty of folks in the, the local bar and also at our office that can guide you through the eviction process. Um, of course, if you win, um, you can stay in the unit. Um, the landlord can appeal and you should still present yourself because you might lose on the appellate, uh, at the appellate level, which is the county court level. Um, and you want to make sure that you are, that your client is able to avoid um, violating the lease in the future because they're, you're more likely to, will we, for instance, we have clients um, who are being evicted for um, having, you know, an unauthorized occupant living with them. And then we were, you know, we win the case, but then they don't pay the rent. And we're like, well, now we have a non-payment of rent case, and that's, that's going to complicate everything. Um, so you want to make sure that during all of this, your client is actually not violating the, the lease in any other way. Um, if you lose, then um, you have to appeal. Um, or if you don't appeal within the five days, and this is calendar days, um, you um, will be served with a 24-hour mm -hmm. writ of possession. 
and that means that the constable or sheriff can physically remove you and your things, and the things will be placed in the front yard. Um, okay, appealing and eviction judgment. So you have your five days include Saturday, Sundays, and legal holidays. Um, some of our JPs close before five o'clock on certain days. If that's the case, then you get um, a, an extension to the next business day. Um, you can pay for your appeal with the cash bond, appeal bond, or Popper's affidavit. There is a Supreme Court form that is used for the Popper's affidavit, and so we can also show you how to use those. Um, but it's pretty straightforward information. And if the person is receiving um, public benefits like SSI or food stamps um, or Medicaid, the, um, the Popper's affidavit can't be contested. That is, no one can say you're not actually eligible for a free appeal, you, you know, because they, they've already proven to some sort of federal government agency that they are eligible. Um, yes? Any electronic filing for that the appeal? Is there electronic filing that's accepted? Um, I think there is, yeah. You can electronic file, yeah. Yeah, you can. Um, Some of them will allow you to file by fax. Yes. And so JP court is, um, or JP courts are used a lot by pro se litigants. And so a lot of times we'll just, you know, file them themselves or we fax them in for people. But if we've made an appearance, then yeah, we're going to go ahead and make, make an appearance and then do the appeal um, electronically. Um, okay, so say that your, your client has paid and, and the thing is that the, um, your client could be poor as a result of this tragedy, right? So maybe they have great income or they don't have access to it, to their bank account, et cetera. And so um, this doesn't mean that you know, they're saying, I've always been poor and, and that's it. It's, it's very much, um, uh, you're taking a glance at what's happening right now. And so um, if you're, so say you, you, know, you file with the, with the pauper's affidavit, then um, your client is still responsible for the rent. And so they have to pay one month's rent into the court registry of the JP um, and also pay the rent as it becomes due. And it's by, if it's the first of the month, it's, the code says, or the rules say that you have until the fifth of the month to pay into the court registry. Um, once it's appealed, it's gonna come to the county courthouse. And so your client would make the payments here. Um, and if they don't, then the writ of possession can issue. Okay, so we recommend often that people file their appeals because so you have two five-day deadlines. The first one to appeal, which is five days, we recommend wait almost until the last day unless you think that it's going to be hard for you to get to the courthouse, whatever. Um, and then after that, you have five days to pay into the court registry. If you lose in county court, then you have to file um, a supersedious bond um, within 10 days or move out within 10 days. Okay, so reasonable accommodations. Um, under both the federal and state um, Fair Housing Acts, people have a right to ask for a reasonable accommodation um, of a physical or mental disability, whether it's temporary or permanent. And this is a, an accommodation of the rules, practices, policies, um, when the accommodation would afford them the, the opportunity to keep, continue to use the dwelling. So it can be written by an attendant, um, an attorney, healthcare provider, and this is what Soraya was talking about earlier with the employment kind of accommodations. Um, there's a lot of, of um, a lot of case law actually that we use in housing law comes from the employment um, uh, case law and precedent. And so you want to establish a connection right between what's happening with the disability and what's happening with their inability to comply with the lease, which could include not paying the rent. So an example that I think is relevant here is a tenant who has post-traumatic stress disorder, right? They were um, at the scene, um, they may not have any physical injuries, but they are having panic attacks and they cannot um, concentrate at work. And so they're starting to miss days and a lot of people in El Paso are wage workers. If you don't work, you don't get paid. Um, they don't have savings and can't pay the rent. And so one, I would say first and foremost, recommend that people get counseling as soon as possible. We, there are a lot of resources that we can connect you with um, if people don't have insurance, um, because that is peace of mind and people staying you know, alive and not, um, not letting this progress is really key. Um, then you can send a reasonable accommodation letter asking the landlord, um, even maybe the mortgage company for more time um, due to their inability to work because of the PTSD. Um, and you want to attach, again, the police reports, 
uh, a letter from a medical provider. Hopefully at that point you already have something, they've already been talking to someone. Um, and then refer the tenant to foundations for financial assistance and hopefully that's, that's going to be part of the plan. So this is my information. Um, do you all have any questions? I'm worried a couple of things for a couple of landlords. Is your opinion part of the ethics of a lawyer assisting somebody in the situation after the judgment? They file Chapter 13 bankruptcy and only list the landlord. And then pro bono, not pay the filing fee. Because there are two other deadlines that come up. First, it's filing the bankruptcy. The landlord client came to you too late. A writ of possession is not saved. The judgment is saved. But either the bankruptcy is begun after the judgment, the writ of possession can go. So I'm not a fan of bankruptcy. Um, and I'm not, not either. But right. not, I read that and I thought, well, well that's my idea. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you get desperate, but I think that um, at this point, the, the concern with any kind of disaster, with you know Hurricane Harvey, with um, with this for us, is that there's a lot of money pouring in, you know, from from people who are, are well-meaning, and it's going to go into the foundations. And I think the foundations are being very responsible about figuring out a plan for how to distribute that that money. Um, and I think that if the one of the questions I would consider is, is this person going to qualify for that assistance, and can we just hold everyone off enough? For, for them to get that kind of assistance or to get help, you know, help so that they can get back on their feet. Um, I, I think because everyone in El Paso is aware of what's happened, that we're hopefully not going to see these issues come up um, a lot. Another thing I would point out is that a writ of possession must be issued within six days of the judgment. And the case I saw, if the tenant knew this, could have easily kept the bankruptcy going before it was dismissed for about uh, 60 right. days. And then, what, well, the landlord has to start over as far as right. I Right, so there, um, we are, at Trello, we're very lucky, even though we're in El Paso, we have offices throughout the state and we have great team managers. And so our team manager for housing, our group coordinator for housing is Fred Fuchs, um, who has 30 plus years of experience. And so we are able to find, um, almost always a good solution for people to be you know, to stay in their homes and so there um, I didn't go through these but with evictions there are some um, rules about the hearing for instance it has to be held within six to ten days uh, of you being served so if that deadline has come and gone then you can say you know it's dismissed um, the notice to vacate might be defective and there are a lot of things that we can do creatively to get people um, to keep people housed uh, while we figure things out with um, even with um, post foreclosure evictions, if, you know if there if the foreclosure was done the wrong way and we can do an affirmative lawsuit and the bank was able to recover the house at the foreclosure, we might be able to get the house back. It's um, it becomes more and more challenging. So that's why with these cases, we want to make sure that we're there on the front end. Um, and again, this happened August third. Um, we don't know if people had paid their mortgage or their rent you know, before the shooting. And they may not be able to do that even up to now. And so I think that you know, we're gonna start, as a legal community, start to see these legal issues come up um, regularly. What about uh, a, a person is renting at an apartment complex that does not allow pets, and now she want, the, the tenant wants to have like, a service animal because to help them with the PTSD. What happens in those situations? So that's also a reasonable accommodation and, um, and one that we practice a lot at our office. Um, so um, yes, if you are, uh, the accommodation requests have to um, make exceptions to people. And landlords will tell us, well, what do you mean? I need to treat everyone the same. And it's like, well, until a disability claim is made. Because if someone is saying that they need an emotional support animal or a service animal, then that's not a pet. That's something that helps them with their health condition. You wouldn't question them if they started using a walker or if they changed their medication. That's none of your business. And so this animal is a tool. It's a medical, it's part of their medical treatment. 
And we've been, I think, pretty successful in, in arguing those cases. Um, I think we have a really great community, for the most part, of landlords. Um, and we haven't had to litigate that too much. And when we have, it was expensive for the landlord. Um, so, yeah. any other questions? So that's why it's important for people to, if that's the case, that they find a lawyer as soon as possible, um, and then figure out if we can remove the case back to state court, or you know, what it is that we need to do in those situations, um, because it can get complicated. Um, but um, the sooner we can address it, the better. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, so I know the property code uh, requires a landlord to send a notice uh, to where a tenant has passed away. You have to send a certified mail, you get 30 days uh, for, I guess, you know, a designated person to collect the property. Uh, if the landlord isn't trying, I guess, doesn't want to comply with that, are there any, what kind of remedies would, I guess, a, a surviving heir have? So you're talking about the personal property? Yeah, personal property. Um, well, I think, you know, we haven't had that, that happen. Um, I think, I mean, you're going to have to establish who the heirs are, right, and who has authority. So I think that you'd want to contact the landlord as soon as possible to make that clear that you have someone who potentially could be the, the, um, the heir. I think the, primarily the landlord's concern, as the bank's concern, is money. They want to be able to lease that place again. So I think if you're able to make some sort of compromise where you're willing to provide the cost of the storage, um, that you might be able to negotiate something out because that's really what they I mean most of the time landlords aren't really trying to keep people's things and then sell them because at that point you can file a police report because now it's theft right they don't have you'd have to look at the lien provisions because at that point I think it's operating as a lien and the lien requirements are, are kind of stiff for landlords it has to be written in the lease that they are allowed to do a lien um, etc the abandonment provisions of the property code might give them some freedom um, but it's not absolute and so they still have some obligations to deal with people's things responsibly. 